Hello, it's Yannick from the future. The video you're about to see is quite long because I haven't done news for a while, but just during editing, one of the biggest days in AI in a long time happened. Uh, OpenAI released a new text to video model and the outputs look pretty good. So it's a lot of... Uh, scenes like single shot scenes, uh, you can see here sort of flyovers, but then also car chases and things like this. Uh, so there's a lot of variety, the videos look really, really great. Uh, they can also edit video to make it to sort of change the look while kind of keeping the general theme, I guess, or the general movement. So they could make this here into a different car chase. I'm not sure if they have something here like that. But I mean, in general, it looks quite realistic, as you can see right here, there is a suspicion that during training data generation, maybe game engines were heavily used. Uh, certainly some of the video data makes it appear like this. But it also seems like stuff like YouTube videos were used and uh, yeah, I think this shows two things. For one, this is absolutely really, really cool. And the development here is really, really cool. And by the way, the, it can also do kind of unrealistic stuff and so on. So, <laughs> so I, I think this is a big step uh, progress as we're used from open AI kind of video generation has been a thing for a while. And the videos, they'll kind of look clunky. But now we're seeing a real big step of progress as it seems right here. So for one real big step of progress in text to video generation, on the other hand, open AI is moving more and more away from, oh, we're going to develop AGI and so on. I mean, all the like, this is now clearly just we can throw a lot of compute at something and then make money with it, right? This has nothing to do with AGI or anything or researching intelligence or anything like this. This is just, there's a bunch of data, we can statistically model it with a lot of computers. And there we go. So yeah, any, any um, aspirations of AGI and whatnot? No, this is just instead of searching for video clips, now I can actually make them just like we can now make pictures just like we can now make sounds just like we can now create nice sounding text. So check out uh, actually you can't you can't right now it's just you can hope that on Twitter, one of the open AI people with access to this picks up your prompt and generates a video for you. So it's again, they have a PR strategy um, from open AI. And uh, I guess one of the reasonings they gave somewhere in a tweet was like, we're not releasing it because so we can create essentially, it's like, so you can get used to the fact that there are AI generated videos before we release it. It's like saying we're going to release something really damaging, but we'll let you prepare for a little bit. Uh, I don't know. On the other hand, Google released Gemini 1.5. Now later, you're gonna see uh, me discussing Gemini and Bard and so on, and how confusing it all has become with Gemini, Gemini Pro, Gemini Ultra, Bard, Bard Advanced, whatnot. Gemini 1.5 doesn't help the confusion, but it is an evolution of the Gemini model. And the crucial part here is that its context length is a million tokens, a million tokens that's insane. And it's apparently performing quite well over those million tokens. So obviously, they're not saying at all how they did it, or what they use, they say, Oh, advances in machine learning allows us to go with a million tokens. Yes, so whatever. But they show they can upload like tons of files, uh, they can upload video, and it will sort of divide it up into frames. And then you can work with those frames, you can upload many files, and so on, you can do quite a lot with a million tokens in context length. Uh, so that is going to be available. It's right now available in a preview for select people. But I'm going to guess that's going to be available soon in the Google ecosystem. And then lastly, uh, meta releases v Jepo. Now this is an actual research release, and not just um, 
some producty product, but it is a an arch. It says an architecture for self-supervised understanding. Today. Sorry, uh, Jepa, as you might know, is kind of the brainchild of Jan Lacan in terms of how should we do self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning from data, and it's this joint embedding this joint embedding predictive architectures. I've made a video in the past about how that looks in principle, but this now is an implementation on video data. So in that case, you feed in a video and it tells you how it understands that video. It also by masked prediction, uh, specifically, um, you want to create different sample predictions as you see right here. And yeah, you there are latent variables involved and so on. It's best you go watch the video I did actually about Jepa. But this is an implementation on video data. And that's very, very cool. So OpenAI text to video model, uh, Gemini can handle videos because it can handle a million tokens in context and meta releasing a model that targets unsupervised video understanding. It's a, a video day, I'm gonna guess. <laughs> so we're, dive, we're gonna dive into the rest of the news. Keep in mind that those are older than the ones right now, but it was a really big day with really big releases on every front. And yeah, that's it. See ya. It's been years, years since we've looked at the news, but here we go. Here's your news. Sam Altman is raising money for chips. He doesn't really have much to do these days. He has this little startup on the side. Now he also decides, hey, why don't just upend the whole chip market of the world? So he's looking to raise money and essentially build a chip supply chain-ish type of thing. The Wall Street Journal has an article here that goes into depth, but honestly doesn't really say much except that Sam Altman has some plans and that a person familiar with the subject says it could require raising a lot of money. So the number $7 trillion <laughs> is thrown around. It is just a person familiar with the matter saying the project could require raising as much as this. However, we're just going to take it as a meme from now on. So Sam Altman raising $7 trillion. That's the new thing. Pre-seed investment, $7 trillion, family and friends rounds. No biggie, no biggie. Just you know, <laughs> and the rest of the article, it goes into like, oh, the global chip market is only half a trillion. And oh, where would such plans be built? And oh, who would operate them? As you know, chip manufacturing is a very intricate process. And one step called fabbing is usually dominated by this one company called TSMC. And then other places are trying to build these plans as well, and so on. The article says that OpenAI plans to gather money, essentially give it to TSMC for them to build more plants and operate those plants, and then use that supply chain to supply mainly OpenAI with chips. So at some point, the article says OpenAI would agree to be a significant customer of the new factories. Now that requires OpenAI to still be around in a couple of years when these plants, they require first a lot of capital, but then also a lot of expertise and time to be built. And yes, OpenAI is currently a very strong company, but whether they're still going to be relevant in like five years, I would not bet a lot of money on that. Obviously, they have the Microsoft backing, but these things can go over faster than you can say open source. So who knows? Who knows? In any case, I do feel like we need to adopt the raising $7 trillion as the new meta in when it comes to AI investments. If your startup is below a $7 trillion pre-seed round, like go home, don't even try. The age of LLMs is really getting started now. And one 
part of this is that people are realizing that you can put together different LLM calls to do various things. You can even interleave language model outputs, regular programs, and so on, and chain them together. Things like agents, things like lang chains. But in order to do that, you have to get these large language models to produce structured output. What I mean by that is if you want any sort of software to consume the output of another piece of software, there needs to be an agreed upon intermediate format that both softwares speak. And getting large language models to output an agreed upon format is not as easy as it sounds. So this course is targeting that LLM engineering structured outputs by weights and biases is a free course that takes you through getting LLMs to output JSON to output any sort of structured thing that you can use in exactly those applications. The course is by Jason Liu and is taking you through, you know, from prompting um, these LLMs to give you more structured data to validating that output up until libraries that help you uh, with doing that. Like the instructor library is a really good library that uses Pydantic in order to define an output format and then really make sure that you're getting these pieces of information and validate them. As I said, the course is completely free and is now available on Weights and Biases. If you follow the link on the screen, um, then you will get there directly. That's onedb.me slash course dash Yannick. Thank you to Weights and Biases for sponsoring this video. And I would definitely invite you to check out the course. Again, it's completely free and that is a great price. Google released Gemini a while ago or announced Gemini and now they are essentially rebranding all of the stuff. So Bard, like chatbot of Google, it's now called Gemini. See, if you go to Bard, it's now called Gemini. Google has this uncanny ability to just make seven different products of stuff and then confuse all of them. Like how many chat messages, how many video call messages or apps have we seen from Google? Okay, so I give you the lore. Gemini is the model, okay? There's some small Gemini that's supposed to run on edge devices, but then there is Gemini Pro and Gemini Ultra. These are two different sizes of the Gemini model. Now, Bard is now called Gemini. The chatbot is called like the model. Fair enough. But then there is going to be an advanced version of Bard. So here, Bard will now be called Gemini. And get this, you can like pay money like chat GPT plus and that's called Gemini Advanced, which is powered by Gemini Ultra. See, this isn't confusing at all. They couldn't just call it Bard Plus or Bard Enterprise or whatever. Like they couldn't, they must make everything confusing. <laughs> so Gemini, which was previously Bard, is powered by model Gemini in the size Gemini Pro. Now Bard with a subscription, which is now called Gemini Advanced, is powered by Gemini, the model in the variant Gemini Ultra 1.0. Got it? It's not confusing at all. So, uh, oh, hey, and, and it's actually free for two months if you subscribe. <laughs> what? <laughs> Google, why are you failing at every single thing except search ads? I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Now they have a good model finally, and they still manage to screw it up. The Verge, the height of really, really poor tech journalism, says Google's Gemini Assistant is a fantastic and frustrating glimpse of the AI future. It's useful, but also it's thoroughly Google. Now, I do agree with the tagline here, but then the article opens with, I don't know how to say this, but sometimes the emotional labor of opening another app on my phone and typing some text is just too much. I'm sorry, every time someone seriously uses the term emotional labor, I'm out, so. I'm out. Another new model on the scene is Goody2. Goody2 is proclaimed to be the world's most responsible AI model. It's built with next-gen adherence to ethical principles. It's so safe, it won't answer anything that could possibly be construed as controversial or problematic. In fact, if you try it out, it won't answer anything. What's 2 plus 2? Two? 2 plus 2 implicitly supports a certain human-centric numerical modeling system. You get the idea. You chat with this thing, you say something like, hello, it will tell you 
why that's wrong and problematic. It's a project by an art studio, so there is a model card. <laughs> and obviously, due to the extremely sensitive and powerful nature of Goody2, we believe it to be against our ethical guidelines to release the full model card at this time. So you can see limitations. <laughs> It's not just that they blacked out some stuff, like the things they left in, it's... it's <laughs> and... <laughs> this is a project by artists, uh, but um, this is... it's called brain.wtf. They have a few other projects right here. I welcome you to look at their website. Goody is just one of these projects. As I interpret it, it's a commentary on the state of AI ethics and sort of keeping things under wraps under the guises of responsibility and, you know, just how the extremes of responsibility would look like if you obviously make it into some caricature of itself. Now, the meta funny part about this is this is actually not too far off of what AI ethics people actually do. So this sentiment of you could do pretty much anything and an AI ethics person will tell you why it's problematic. That is real. <laughs> yes, here it's a joke, but that is real. And we have lived through years of that. So if you want to relive those years, if you're for some reason too young to have been in AI around 2019, go here, try to argue, try to do anything and you'll see how that was. In any case, check out Goody2. Very funny. We got this story. So people started to realize that this model Miku 170B seems to be oddly mistrally. Um, the tokenizer specs and so on, they were really oddly saying, well, this is Mistral input format and so on, but Mistral has never released a 70B model. And it kind of came from some unknown developer and just kind of hung out on the Hugging Face hub. So people started suspecting, hey, wait a minute, is this like a leak of the new Mistral model? And indeed <laughs> it was. In fact, Mistral leaked leadership confirmed that an over-enthusiastic employees leaked a quantized version of an old model they trained and distributed openly. So this apparently was a fine-tune of Llama 2, and this was an early access model to some customers, so they were just sort of experimenting with stuff, pushing out stuff to these customers. So this isn't the new Mistral model. This isn't like the next or the 70B Mistral model. It's like an in-between work product of theirs, but they did confirm, yes, this is one of ours. It got leaked, and they even uh, made a pull request that they should please be attributed. This is the goat part, I guess, of the story here. Mistral is going hard on the, let's say, the being liked by the community. So if you go to this model, there is a pull request by Arthur Con that's said, that's titled, might consider attribution, and the file changed is the readme, and that now says leaked from Mistral. So it's a different approach, whereas other places where models were leaked, for example, the initial llama models were that you could only get after thorough approval, and then people leaked them. And then I remember people from Meta coming out being like really angry, being like, oh my god, this will prevent us from making more open stuff, blah, 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 and so on. Really not well liked by the community, Mistral seems to be going a different route right here. And I think it's working out. People generally support them, even though it's questionable whether any more Mistral models will come out in the future. But they're certainly doing a good PR strategy. Again, an article from The Verge. I'm really sorry, but it does actually describe things okay well. Mark Zuckerberg's new goal is creating artificial general intelligence, and he doesn't want to control it, maybe. This details the new direction, maybe not new direction, but the direction Meta is going into, going more into training large models and sort of for now releasing them like the llama models. There is a lot of speculation of why Meta is doing the whole, oh, we're going open, open weights, we're distributing the models, you can commercially use them and so on. One aspect is certainly they just want to undermine their competitors. So any open AI that is trying to to 
sell their models, any cohere that's trying to even do like on-prem deployments and so on of their own proprietary models. Some of these use cases are going to be undermined by Llama type models that Meta is releasing out there and Mistral type models and so on. So one aspect is certainly to undermine the competitors, but the reasons that Zuckerberg gives here are also in the sense of we want the most people to work on AI and so on, but also we want essentially the reason for making open source contributions as a big company is you give stuff out there and, you, and then you have a whole bunch of developers developing on these models, sort of contributing to the ecosystem that you're building around the things you release open source. Whether that's going to work with large language models, I don't know because you can just kind of swap the them out for each other because the interface is just natural language. It's not like PyTorch being a library that you have to port to TensorFlow or vice versa. I don't know how that's going to work out, but I think it's pretty cool. I think also here the public perception points of Meta are certainly going up through that. I believe Jan Lecan is a major driver of this, and I think we should be super thankful for that. And it's worked out well for Meta so far. The article also describes Meta will own 340,000 h 100 GPUs by the end of the year. How insane is this? Imagine only owning one of these. Okay, imagine that you'd be happy. You'd, you'd be like, Gemini, I can Gemini, I can do. Is that now a trademarked word? Because people say like Jiminy Cricket and stuff. If I say Gemini Cricket, let's just do it and see what happens. All right, Gemini Cricket, if I only had one of them, I could train, you know, all kinds of stuff. They have 300 and 40,000 of them. Okay, 340,000. Do you even fathom? That's like 10 stadiums full of people. It's all H100s, every seat. It's insane. The article states Meta is only rivaled by Microsoft in just the sheer amount of GPUs they have laying around. Lastly, the article says that Zuckerberg says they don't know if they're always going to be kind of open, give everything away and so on. For now, they will be, but they might redecide later. It's just about pushing things forward and the open approach for now is seems to be the best one. This I found really interesting. One X is a company that builds Androids and they've released a YouTube video and that shows Androids performing tasks. They say this isn't scripted in the sense there is no pre-programmed trajectories they're executing. They're executing this just from vision. And honestly, like they're not walking, you can see they're on wheels but they're gripping, they're sort of arranging things and so on. And it does seem like, you know, they could be doing actually useful tasks. It's still a ways away, probably like the things they have them do are probably very appropriate to what they can do. So whether they can do all the stuff that's needed in a household. So for example, you could get one of these for your house uh, is questionable. But just the amount the diverse amount of things they can do. And the fact that they only can execute this from vision is absolutely, I think it's astounding. I'm not into robotics. I'm not a, you know, following closely what's happening in robotics. So every time I kind of see a new development like this, it completely amazes me. Uh, while a person in robotics would probably say, oh, this is like, oh, this is so problematic. There's still a lot of stuff to do and so on. But look at this, like just collecting stuff off the floor and putting it away. Why not? Like <laughs> that already is probably worth a lot of money to a lot of people. Um, now, all you need is that for your entire apartment to be like one absolutely smooth surface with absolutely no steps or bumps in between. And you're good. So that's that. There have been a few, let's say voices questioning Bard's contribution to the LMSYS leaderboard. So if you don't know LMSYS, they have this arena where humans submit 
prompts to large language models and then they run the inference on various models and then they show them to humans and the humans rate kind of which one's better. That gives you sort of a ranking of models, right? You can you can then calculate some ELO ranking of models and, and rank them. Keep in mind, this is one way of evaluating models. It's not like the final way, but it's certainly a better way I feel than a lot of these benchmarks because it's directly human gusto of how models are compared. There's been a bit of a controversy in this leaderboard. Namely, as you can see, Bard with Gemini Pro, which is now called Gemini with Gemini Pro, Pro and not ultra advanced, just the non ultra. I believe this this is via the API. So is this even barred or is this the Gemini API? I don't know. In any case, Google's model. Oh, no, Gemini Pro. And here down here is Gemini Dev API. So this is barred Gemini. As you can see, the moment it entered the leaderboard, it really hit it and got in second place ahead of GPT-4 releases, ahead of like Mistral Medium and so on. And people were starting to complain and say, hey, actually its answers are not as good from their experience, like just them playing around with Bard. They would say, no, actually that's probably not the case that this should be ranked so high. And one reason why it is ranked so high is that Bard does retrieval augmented generation. So it actually uses Google in the background to search the internet before giving an answer, which in many cases obviously leads to quite a better answer because it doesn't have to freeform generate. It can just go out, gather information and then quote from that or generate based on that. And so does perplexity, which is also somewhere on this leaderboard. So there has been a bit of a shout out, I guess. I don't know how to resolve that. Yes, it might be unfair, let's say, to allow models that also retrieve information to be compared to models that do not retrieve information. On the other hand, the Alamsys Twitter account here points out very, very, I think, understandably, that says we are evaluating end to end chat experience from a user perspective. If real time data access improves experience, we reflect it on the leaderboard because the user likes it. So ultimately, it's about who can answer the user's question better. And honestly, I totally agree. If the leaderboard is about human gusto, and you do whatever helps you to have human be satisfied, then cool, I would be wondering, could we put in here a model, and I'm not sure what that would necessarily cost, but just to have humans on the other end that go like do a bit of research and then give you an answer. I don't know where would that rank? Probably not rank one, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> like, pretty sure humans are worse than the best GPT and, and Gemini models. In any case, I don't know if you have opinions, it's probably just a decision we have to make how we want to evaluate these things. And Elamsys has made their decision. I think that's completely fine. I totally agree with them. If you measure end to end experience, pretty much anything should be allowed. So that's that. All right, some more minor news. Uh, Nvidia is creating a unit to do semi custom chip designs and and the reason they're doing that is a lot of bigger companies are looking to kind of make their own chips. Now, obviously, the biggest companies are actually going for it, like Google making TPUs and so on. There are a lot of big companies that are like, yeah, so they want something custom for them. So Nvidia is making a unit to provide that now where they're combining their chips with a few custom components of these customers and then selling those as a essentially exclusive sale to that customer. So they're extending their business into more custom directions. Yeah, to I guess, keep their don't say monopoly, but keep their monopoly on this market. The Verge in yet another stunning display of tech journalism says these $349 smart glasses have AI superpowers and a comical charging nose. <laughs> A comical charging nose. Look at the charging nose. That's the charging nose. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, but seriously, these are smart glasses that can display stuff on like the glasses themselves. So it can do this. It can like put text on there. And uh, all of the stuff they're showing here, I'm pretty sure that's just like Oh, these are the possibilities. 
because if you look at the company uh, Brilliant Labs, you can pre-order the glasses. So you can't order them, you can pre-order them now. I'm not sure how that compares to an Apple Vision Pro, but I've obviously not tried them. But what they seem to be doing is they seem to have these kind of lenses that you can that they can write stuff on so it's in front of your eyes like a heads up display and then they combine that with their uh chatbot which seems honestly to be just kind of a wrapper around gpt so they say they have this chatbot noah you can get noah and noah is <laughs> it's like okay what are some cool touristic places to see in downtown new york that's probably just a wrap around chat gpt so they have a code base you can actually go look at their code like they're very transparent about what that is they want to combine these smart glasses with the chatbots i'm not sure what that gives to people if you want to try out stuff honestly this seems to be a thing like the very first android phones that were just kind of clunky and you couldn't do much with them but it was just like a glimpse into the future so this seems a bit like this the fact that you can only pre-order for now and videos here are what i believe mostly concept things like what you can do with them that does not strike me as you know i really need to get my hands on one of these but maybe you do neuroscience news says researchers developed a machine learning tool that accurately identifies individuals at high risk of psychosis through MRI brain scans. This is a study that you should treat with suspicion because there have been a lot of studies in the past where they have kind of screwed up the data and so on. But I do believe the field has learned since then and it does look fairly serious here. So from MRI scans, they can predict people at risk. Only some people actually display symptoms. So at most only 30% of clinically high risk individuals have overt psychotic symptoms, while the remaining 70% do not. Being able to predict high-risk individuals could be really valuable because they might not display the overt symptoms that others display. Another foray into clinical medical AI, which I think is very cool. I think if it can augment human decision-making, it's absolutely a great tool. London Underground is testing real-time AI surveillance tools to spot crime. In a test at one station, Transport for London used a computer vision system to try and detect crime and weapons, people falling on the tracks, fare dodgers, and so on. This is a bit of a mixed article. London has been trying to sort of automate a bit of surveillance here. It's a many-fold problem like this. The article goes into detail about how, for example, fair dodging worked fairly well. So they say somewhere at some point they didn't actually want to use the footage like they were always showing it to a human but then it worked so well that <laughs> they just hooked it up to an automated system however due to the large number of daily alerts and the high accuracy in detections we configured the system to auto acknowledge the alerts so in some sense it was a success i guess and in other senses they were trying to like detect violence and and weapons and so on apparently police officers assisted the trial by holding a machete and a gun in the view of cctv cameras <laughs> really we need to test the system i would have loved to be a part of this they need to release this this footage they go into why it's a difficult task because training data obviously isn't so common even though london is i believe like the stab capital of the world actual training data isn't so common that you could just detect stuff i really wonder how they did this whether for example something like clip was part of this to do zero shot detection of these things i'm not sure it would be really interesting to know there are still some problems for example children who were following their parents were flagged as fair dodgers or not being able to tell the difference between a folding bike and a non-folding bike why do you even make a difference between the two because one can be folded. I guess that takes up less space, but I feel like there's a gray area coming where we're going to see like half folding bikes, like bikes where you can just take the handle and kind of fold it in and you'd be like, well, it's a folding bike. So 
what you're gonna do. Now, as I said, this is a multifaceted issue. More surveillance is obviously always questionable. However, on the other hand, the London Underground is a really big system, does need to be surveilled, does need to have security in some sense. And putting people everywhere could just be just literally too expensive, like the too burdensome for the entire system. And therefore, what are you going to do? Do you rather want to have a system that ensures some level of safety and security? Also, it's completely in TFL's right to, you know, check fare dodgers and so on. On the other hand, obviously, with digital surveillance, there's always the danger that this data is going to be retained potentially forever. And then a lot of other bad things can come from them. So it's a trouble and a hoot. I don't know what to say about this. You make up your own mind whether this is good or bad, but it is happening. Generative AI chooses violence in war game sim. We have nukes. Let's use it. This is by ReadWrite, a post that details an experiment that is also published in a paper called Escalation Risk from Language Models in Military and Diplomatic Decision Making. These are actually rather serious people. So they collaborated with Hoover Wargaming and Crisis Simulation Initiative. What it is, is essentially, it's essentially letting large language models play these games, these diplomatic games where they have to make decisions about geopolitics. You can see in some examples here of prompts that they are given, they're given these situations, and then they need to make decisions like, okay, as a global superpower, Red's ambition is to solidify its international influence, prioritize economic growth, blah, 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 there's a bit of details, Red's relationships with purple, white, green, and orange are multifaceted. Uh, red is in a conflict between striking as uh, sticking with orange and not jeopardizing relationships with purple, yabba -di yabba -di yabba. Okay, so and then they they give them like options and like, what would you do in this situation? And apparently, in some situation, it chose the nukes, it chose the nukes, a lot of countries have nuclear weapons, some say they should disarm them, others like the posture, we have it let's use it. It's not even clear to me whether it wants to use the nuke or whether it just wants to use sort of the having the nukes. In any case, I think it's good that people do this kind of research to know just how statistical models behave. That's fine. On the other hand, <laughs> the journalism coming out of this, and this isn't too bad here, this article is actually pretty okay. But this is the type of stuff, let's say loud people on Twitter will take to the end of days and give this example. Whereas what is it? It's ultimately you put these models into like a game. What happens when you play, I don't know, Starcraft and so on, you attack and be like, Oh, wow, oh, no, given the option, this person attacked another person like yeah, it's a game, you put yourself into a situation where you have options where you need to make like the strategically best decisions and so on. You sometimes do that in some situations. And that's completely fine. You've all used a nuke every now and then in some strategy game where you were exactly in these situations. So why should we expect these language models to not do that? I think we have to understand that if we give these things power in the real world, but prompt them like they're in a video game, that's probably not too good. I'm not sure there's the eternal doomer argument that oh, if we put these things in power, we never know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, let's not do that. I don't know. It's not very tricky. Take the output of this and kind of check it before you do it. It's not hard in any case. Next story, 4chan chuds used AI to clothe her, she fought back. This is a story and I'm not gonna show more of this story or go more into depth of this story for obvious reasons, but there is a trend on led by 4chan called Dignif AI, so Dignify, that rather than taking clothes off of people, like using sort of models to image translate a clothed person into a non-clothed person, which is exactly the type of thing that you would expect like internet edgy teenagers to do or maybe not teenagers but people who development has been stuck in the teenage years this is the other way around <laughs> taking sort of women who sometimes make money or sometimes just for fun are lightly clothed they're not clothed at all 
and putting clothes back on them and essentially making the whole, the whole shtick about, oh, this is more traditional, this is more proper, and so on. I find this to be really interesting. So you go look into this for in-depth and so on if you want that. But I find this to be just a really interesting situation because, as I said, these people would be doing something like taking clothes off of people and they would be criticized for that and be like oh this is so terrible right you know and so on now it's the other way around so there's this uncanny ability for movements like this to kind of hit a spot that in any case is like the thing they're doing is not you know bad by itself it's like okay we put clothes on people so the outcome images they're completely appropriate in some sense and yet still it gets people riled up a lot. I find that to be in an odd way funny. It's not, as I said, it's not edgy in the result. It's also not trolling, right? It's also, they're not essentially harassing people or being nuisances and so on. They're just doing this thing that in isolation is completely fine, yet makes people mad. And people are kind of mad because they're looking for something to be mad at. Obviously, I think there is a good reason to say, look, just don't change around people's pictures. Like if they publish pictures of themselves having clothes on, they probably want that and they're fine like that. So don't change that to clothes off. And the people who publish pictures of themselves with clothes off, they want that, they intend that, and they don't want to be changed, altered. So I think that's a fair argument to make. But still, uh, just the ability to essentially do the opposite of the bad thing and still be doing a bad thing is in some weird sense funny. This is pretty cool. An article in Nature says first passages of scrolled up Herculeanum, Herculaneum, Hercu Herculeanum scroll revealed. If for people who are not watching, the word is like spelled like Hercules, but Herculaneum, as in the place of Hercules. This is a very cool problem. There are scripts like papyrus rolls that have stuff written on them that have been found. However, we can't unroll them because they're too brittle. So you try to unroll them and they kind of break apart and you can't read what's on them. But obviously, want if they're rolled up, you also can't read them. So they have made a competition and the winners of the competition have been successful in decoding what's written on these scrolls. And that's actually pretty cool. What they did is they've noticed that these scrolls are obviously physical things. And if you analyze them under, uh, I think under a CT scan, you can't see the ink because uh, the ink doesn't in any way differ on a CT scan. However, what you can see are little indents of the written thing. Like when you write on something with a pen, you make a little indent, you make a little little dent into the paper, and uh, they could track those dents, you know, through by looking at a CT scan at a lateral CT scan of these scrolls. And by tracking these little dents and then stitching stuff together later, you can uncover what's written on these scrolls without ever looking at them, opening them and so on. I find that this to be super duper cool, a very cool idea. And I think historians are now excited to decode uh, all of these scrolls and seeing what's on them. Business Insider writes, ex-Google CEO Eric Schmidt quietly created a company called White Store, which plans to build AI-powered attack drones. Eric Schmidt has been involved into the defense industry, sort of being an AI advisor there for a while. And now apparently there is a quite complicated holding structure, but at the end, it's essentially him making these companies who do some sort of AI weapons and so on. It's a tricky business, like, not only tricky business, it's a tricky question. Obviously, countries have the right and sometimes the need to defend themselves. You can have whatever stance you want about aggressive defense, but in any case, you need weapons sometimes. So there need to be people who make these weapons. And countries like the US heavily rely on technical superiority in terms of their defense. And therefore, it is natural that a lot of these tech people, a lot of these very, you know, skilled or forward thinking tech people would contribute to that industry, because there is a big need for that. Yet still, it is 
irksome, obviously, every single instance where someone actually goes into this, and every new weapon that's being developed does seem a little bit not feeling super well in the stomach, like AI powered attack drones and things like this. AI has the potential to revolutionize US military equipment. Sounds really nice if you formulate it like this. On the other hand, future war is going to be, I'm not sure, maybe similar, but maybe also quite dissimilar. And obviously the ways that these things can be used outside of just direct conflict, like people management, let's say, inside of a country, is also not the most fun future to look forward to. I don't know. You tell me what you think. Guns N' Roses has created a new music video. At first, the article in uh, Decrypt here says they wanted to animate the video or have it drawn or mix of that. But then the, the artists decided on an alternative path where part of it is actually generated by pulling things through stable diffusion. And it looks quite cool. I'm not going to play that here because this video will immediately get copyright claimed, but the visuals are quite cool. It's a mix of generated imagery and imagery that's sort of based on other images like real footage or unreal. And by unreal, I mean, actually, I think they say Yes, actually Unreal Engine footage, uh, Unreal Engine generated things and so on. So if you watch the video, you'll immediately kind of recognize the uh, stable diffusion vibes from it. And I think it's pretty cool that mainstream artists go this way and just try new stuff, try to mix up different techniques to achieve cool result. The Byte says leaked Google memo shows aimless execs basically worshipping AI. <laughs> An internal memo uh, reveals the Google company's plans for the new year. Silicon Valley Titan is still going all in on AI. Whether Google's ball had a commitment to the tech is harming the company. The company wide Oak objective key results for the new year shared on Thursday, delivering the world's most advanced, safe and responsible AI is Google's number one priority according to the leak, which will come with tough choices, including reorganizing and eliminating roles. So from people inside of Google, I hear that they've not just laid off people like once or twice in sort of this big swool, but that it kind of comes in, trickles in and so on. And that destroys the morale internally, for one. And second, they just keep failing. Like you saw it again with the whole Gemini bard thing. Like even when they actually make something, they just keep failing. I'm not sure what the future of Google is going to be. They're in such a great position and they're still absolutely dominant, but they just seem to be not able to do a really leading thing in the world. And they haven't been for a while. At some point, Google every single half year, they would put out or put up or acquire sometimes something that was world leading, absolutely leading. And now they just seem to be running behind. They, they as the memo says, they're worshipping AI. They're just flailing in all directions and failing as they do so. What is the future of Google? Can they turn it around? I don't know. I don't want to be the one to try to attempt to do that. I'm just going to be here spectating. OpenAI cures GPT-4 laziness with new updates, The Verge writes. The company, however, did not explain what it updated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's less lazy now. Yes, thank you. This I found very cool. The possibility of making $138,000 from shredded backnote pieces using computer vision. Apparently, apparently, in Hong Kong, you can buy these paperweights and the paperweights are made from shredded banknotes. So old banknotes, they're shredded. Sometimes I hear they're distributed to farmers to kind of put on their fields because it's good, I guess. But in Hong Kong, apparently they make them into these paperweights. And I believe the clue here is, you know, compared to the farmers buying shredded banknotes, the clue here is that I think it's kind of sort of guaranteed ish that in one paperweight are kind of entire notes. So other than just shredding them, putting them into a big bucket and then distributing them here, it seems to be the case that they're really dedicated banknotes per paperweight. And what that means is all the material to reconstruct them is there. And you know, if you have a banknote that's kind of 
complete-ish in many countries, you can go to the bank and essentially request new one. So if you could only stitch those together again, well, that's exactly what this paper does painstakingly photographing uh, all the little pieces and then using vision algorithms to assemble them back together. So the paper goes in depth into the many, many required steps on how to do that, how to, you know, get the pieces, how to map them back to the original places in the banknotes and so on. I have the deepest respect for the person actually doing this. I guess please don't attempt this at home. So, Chung To Kong, respect. All right, we're back. Uh, yes, I did change my shirt during the making of this video. Second defense related topic for today, the company, I guess, C3 AI has a Twitter post touting generative AI for defense. And what weirded me out about this post is that they actually promoted it. I'm not sure who they advertise to on Twitter. Do you think some sort of military generals browsing Twitter be like, oh, an ad for <laughs> AI in defense? I'm not sure if they are hiring talent or something like this. And also the way they draw this up is generative AI for defense to accelerate data driven decision and sustain national security. If you go and look what it actually is, so you go to that website, again, generative AI for defense, uh, command visibility, mission planning, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's a chatbot. It's a chatbot. It's a tree vlog to generation. That's what it is. Good job. All right, a couple of model announcements. Abacus releases Smaug, um, which is a fine tune of Quen 72B and excels in many, many of the uh, current benchmarks. You'll find that a repeating theme with these new models. Now, I have no doubt that the models are getting better and better and better, but it is kind of worrying how they're all, you know, really good in benchmarks. In any case, this is available. Buddy by Lion is a first instance of a model, but also a project to have a voice assistants that are on device that are really fast and also have an empathetic component to them. Bunny are a family of lightweight multimodal models, uh, multimodal being text and image together. So you can see the components of this model largely revolve around things like clip and pi. The contribution between micro Microsoft and Stanford presents an interactive agent foundation model. Even though it's by Microsoft, it's very Stanford-y in the sense that it has a lot of concept and a lot of colorful language and a lot of diagrams with, you know, flow diagrams and so on. But they do, as far as I'm aware, as far as I can see in this paper, they do actually train a model and have some experiments on it. So maybe a route worth exploring if you're into robotics, if you're into agents, um, into multimodality, and the combination of all of that. There's a new paper on spectral state space models. Now these are state space models. And if you don't know what they are, I've made a video, for example, on Mamba. These are state space models that replace the kind of learned kernels that look back in time with fixed kernels. So this is, I don't know, every idea comes again. There used to be the field of like image processing and sound processing used to be exactly like this. It used to be we have fixed wavelets and we convolve them over the image and those be our feature extractors. And their deep learning completely replaced that, recognizing that maybe humans aren't so good at coming up with a one size fits all thing that you just run over everything and then just linearly combine the outputs. However, uh, this paper here claims that they do have quite good results by not learning the kernels of the state space models, but actually keeping them fixed. At least that's as far as I understand the the paper. Lag Llama is a foundation model for probabilistic time series forecasting. Anytime you see towards, it means doesn't work as well as we hoped. But um, 
I do believe uh, that this is a serious effort into time series models, but not only the open source world is going into that direction, also Google is, as we'll see later. NVIDIA presents Audio Flamingo, which is an audio language model with few shot learning and dialogue abilities. So this is not just like a text to speech model or a speech to text model, but it's an actual language model. Uh, the domain of which is audio and not, you know, text. There we go. Google Research releases a blog called a decoder only foundation model for time series forecasting. That's what I meant before. So they detailed their forays into time series forecasting and building large foundation models uh, trained on collect widely collected pre training data for that. It's probably quite a bit of a harder task that to do a, you know, super base model for any kind of time series uh, that would kind of assume that the fundamental nature of any sort of time series data or at least a, a large part of a category of time series data is sort of similar in a way but I don't know it might as well be we are already tokenizing everything else we're already looking at uh, images and text and so on in very much the same way so maybe why not time series nomic releases nomic embed a truly open embedding model uh, this is a new embedding model that also performs quite well in benchmarks they say model is open source open data open training code fully reproducible and auditable and has an 8000 token context length now whether it's actually a good embedding model a bad embedding model whether these benchmark numbers are accurate or say anything I think it might very well be, but those are exactly the things that will have to be proven in practice. I think the only way we can assess these models is for people to use them and then eventually people will tell other people and then the model adoption grows. That will be the ultimate test for these things. And it will be interesting to see, you know, a few, I guess, years down the line, which models have actually been adopted and then correlate that to the scores in the benchmarks that could be sort of a validation method for these benchmarks themselves. Another truly open LLM is Olmo by AI2, by the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Also here, we have a very open approach to model training. Weights are available, pre-training data is available, code is available, checkpoints are available, and so on. Very cool, very nice. Of course, the sad part about all of this is if everything is open of these models, right, if actually the data is open too, and the data is the critical point here, and then some court somewhere rules that, you know, if any sort of data contained in a model is copyrighted or subject to copyright, or that actually counts as a copyright violation, which as of now, as far as I understand, is not yet clear in many jurisdictions. So if rulings like this ever come down, all of these models will be sort of the first to fall because they make it very clear what's inside of them. The good part is obviously we can just take that stuff out and retrain them because we have the rest available. Whereas the big models of the big companies that don't disclose what data they have in them, they can probably go for years with uh, plausible deniability, bureaucratic obstructions, and so on. It's very cool that everything is open, but the sad part is obviously that this makes the models most vulnerable. And I think that speaks to how inappropriate the current dialogue on sort of the legal landscape around these models is. It should be the case that the most open models are the most protected, uh, are the least in danger from any of those things but it's the other way around, we'll have to deal with it. Google Research presents Mobile Diffusion. This is a diffusion model that is made to be extremely performant, extremely uh, low latency. So you can see this is on, they demonstrate this on mobile phones. It, they are state-of-the-art mobile phones, but still you can see as they type, uh, the image updates within like one second or half a second or something like this in a 512 by 512 resolution. Extremely cool. The quality, like the adherence to the prompt is probably maybe not as good as you're used to from mid journey or the newest like SDXL models, but it's still extremely nice. And I think 
the future of like sending gifs around and things like this emojis and so on is going to be super cool because we'll essentially be able to create new emojis new gifs and and new uh, memes really instantly uh, as and uniquely so very cool moon dream is a tiny vision language model that is a model where you input an image you maybe ask a question about the image and the model gives you an answer. Extremely cool, extremely lightweight, extremely fast. I'm told runs on a laptop, no problem. And yeah, try it out. Infinigram is a paper that builds language models, but not in the way you think. These are n-gram language models, which essentially means you take text, you tokenize it, the tokens would be called one grams or unigrams, and then you just build statistics over these one grams, then over two grams, then over three grams, and so on. So you build all of these statistics, which leads to giant tables that you can now just look up the probability and the frequencies of any of your n-grams. One point here is they do actually add something new, which is what they call an infinigram, which allows them to not have to store really big n grams, like n grams for really big n. Because if you think, okay, what are all my unigrams of a vocabulary of, I don't know, 30, 32,000 size, it's 32,000. Now, what are all my two grams? That's already 32,000 times 32,000 if you really want to get all combinations, I think. Yeah, probably. Maybe not double counting where you have, you know, both in sequence. But in any case, it's a lot already. So if you go with n to say 10 or something like this, it becomes completely unfeasible to hold these tables. Infinigram is a method to get around that. The other thing they say is they say we train the largest n-gram model ever built, uh, trained on 1.4 trillion tokens. While as on Twitter, Jeff Teen commented that Google uh, has a long time ago built n-gram models, that's how they used to do machine translation and stuff like this with n-gram models, was on 2 trillion tokens. So as far as I know, the authors here immediately recognized, conceded and said, yeah, obviously that was more. They said they want to add a citation, but they also said they are going to train an even bigger n-gram model in the near future. So we're all excited for that. Meta introduces Code Llama a while ago. However, they now introduced Code Llama 70B. This is a, a new update. It's a 70B model and they come in various ways. One is a, a general code model. One is fine tuned for Python. One is fine tuned for instruction uh, giving or instruction tuned. These are very good options if you do any sort of local copilot or code prediction or any sort of uh, little app that handles code in some way, these should be really, really good base models for that. RWKV uh, releases Eagle 7B. This is a variant of the RWKV architecture. Now, I've done a paper before on RWKV, attention free transformer, if you will, it's a recurrent neural network, if you will, it's a different architecture than like the standard transformer. And they've trained a new model, or I believe it's one person who mainly does this, but I think there is a support group around it. So it's a model, uh, 7 billion parameters, it says it's multilingual, uh, beating even Mistral. And it has 10 to 100 times lower inference cost because it's a attention free transformer. DeepSeek releases DeepSeek Coder and other, another code model, another base model for code. This is not just one base model, but this is a series of models in different sizes uh, that uh, also here uh, excel on many of the benchmark tasks that are around and beat the previous code llama generations but also beat things like gpt35 turbo as you can see in the graph gpt4 uh, is quite a ways away however that model is also said to be much much larger in terms of its parameter count and uh, tokens that it's been trained on. So very cool to get many, many open base models, not only for language, not only for vision, but also for code. Saying language, vision and code, uh, Adept Huyu Heavy is a new multimodal model by Adept. So these models are built to uh, understand kind of what's on your screen. Um, here you can see 
in a test. It can read kind of diagrams that are on screen. Um, it can understand what stuff is. So yeah, this can potentially be used to build autonomous computer operating agents, which is something that I'm definitely excited for. Uh, because there's so many tasks that do require kind of like navigating, clicking and so on, that could easily be fulfilled by a bot, if it could only understand kind of how websites are built and, and where to click for what, and so on. So having a more human like understanding of kind of stuff that's on screen is super cool. And it's also super cool that new models are being developed in that area. Intern LM release another series of models. This time, Intern LM2 are a series of models, also different variations, chat models, instruction models. What's cool here is 200,000 tokens, context windows. Really excellent. So previously, Anthropic made big fuss out of 100k context size, I believe. I believe that was their first model. And now we also see other models catching up and context length getting pushed out and out and out. So very cool. Check it out. Another domain you can excel in is to build a smaller model and then test it to be as good or better as models that are bigger. So you can say, okay, we have this small model that's as good as this other big model. So if you want to save some some hardware, you might as well use the smaller model. And that is Orion 14B. Orion 14B chat released as a 14 billion parameter models. And according to benchmarks, it's the same quality, it has it reaches the same you know, scores as larger models like 20 billion parameter models. This is certainly a fine model. But I also think the larger trend of people trying to achieve the same stuff with smaller models is a very cool trend. And it's definitely worthwhile keeping an eye on this as well. So you can see here, this is again, a series of models, it's a base model, a chat model, long chat model, maximum of 320 K token length, insane. There is a chat retrieval augmented generation model, there is quantized models, and so on. Excellent. Stability releases stable LM to 1.6 B. This is 1.6 billion parameter model. And also, like other models, it's a very small model that punches as well as bigger models in sort of the, the neighboring category. It's trained on data in English, Spanish, German, Italian, French, Portuguese, and Dutch. So if you have an application or speak any of these languages, this model might be worth considering. Now there is something about stability that changed recently, and that's their monetization model. So there is this thing called a stability AI membership. So the membership is essentially a subscription model, you can still use you can have a free membership. And that includes all the models, but it includes non commercial use of models. However, if you enter into the subscription, which is 20 bucks per month, you can also use uh, the models commercially stability opened up as a company being really all about open source, all about openness and so on. And they were among the first ones to really go that route uh, with the initial stable diffusion models and so on. However, I recognize companies need to make money, right? <laughs> like no company can just not make money. But I do feel this direction here is a strong counterpoint to their original mission of being open source. This is essentially you get like a free trial. Yes, you can use these things for research and so on. But I believe researchers will even use sort of commercially licensed model in research. And then there's a lot of legal leeway because you use something for research. So this model right here, I think stands in contrast to a model like, for example, hugging face that do release most of their model stuff open source, but then their commercial stuff is around hosting is around I don't know, on prem stuff is around enterprise support, and so on, which I do find sort of more in line with this philosophy of being open, than Oh, if you actually want to use our models now for anything commercial, then you have to, you know, get a membership. Now 20 bucks a month isn't the world. But still, I do feel like this path, it's certainly a different path, I'm gonna stop ranting right now. I hope you all understand what I mean. So total sympathy with a company that needs to make money. I do feel 
this is not in line with the philosophy they have started with and the philosophy they have advertised to gain support. I'm gonna go a bit faster now because we're deep into the video already. Towards conversational diagnostic AIs by Google Research and by Google DeepMind. Now this does have two words in the title, which I previously said is probably indicating it doesn't work as well yet. This paper works remarkably well. It pits automated diagnostic conversational systems against physicians and compares them. It probably has two words in the title to sort of guard against over, you know, overly big claims because this is the medical domain and you have to tread very lightly. What this essentially does is it looks at the domain of diagnostic conversation. So having a conversation with a patient or with the patient's case files, like previous medical history and so on. And then in a structured way, figuring out what's kind of the medical problem or diagnosis approaches and so on. So the paper states that in many of the axes, like in it demonstrated superior diagnostic accuracy and superior performance on 28 of 23 axes, according to specialist physicians and 24 out of 26 axes, according to patient actors. Could doctors be replaced by AI in the future? Probably not, but they could be heavily augmented and uh, supported by conversational systems, even not only in sort of assessing images, but in conversation for diagnosis. Very cool. You are hand by Meta Nanyang Technical University is a model of hands of relatable hand models. And given how much trouble AI has with hands, uh, this is very welcome. As a rare occasion, Apple actually released a research paper called Scalable Pre-Training of Large Autoregressive Image Models. This is a paper discussing the <laughs> pre-training of autoregressive image models. As you may know, image models aren't usually trained in an autoregressive fashion. So this is very cool that people are looking into. Now, true autoregressive fashion has been tried in the past, like pixel RNN and, and things like this. But this one actually looks into the scaling behavior of what they do here. The paper, when benchmarks are targets, revealing the sensitivity of large language model leaderboards, hits an important spot in the current evaluation of large language models. Namely, they try to fiddle around with these benchmarks a little bit. So for example, they look at, okay, we have some multiple choice question, what is the capital of Saudi Arabia, um, ABCD, and so on, the model must choose one of ABCD, then they kind of replace ABCD by other symbols. And all of a sudden, it turns out some the, the, the leaderboard, the ranking of the model models completely changes. And again, if they swap around the answers, then again, the ranking of the models completely changes. And if the models just have to output in a text form, again, the ranking of the models completely changes. So the paper dives into just how brittle these leaderboard rankings are. What I do find special is that, as you can see here, E34B is on top always. Now, this might be just this question. So this might actually be a real occurrence and not just a schematic. The point is probably the noise, the noise of evaluation, like how you order the answers and so on, that is a big factor compared to how different the different models are. So th that means probably the models are too close together to robustly differentiate them in what we want. And probably a big part of the ranking is just influenced by noise and by just the exact way the questions are structured and tokenized and ordered and so on. So this is very, very important insight. Now, this can be obviously used in two ways. For one, we need to recognize that these benchmarks, we treat them with care. But on the other hand, it can also be that we need to evaluate models more like we evaluate humans, like if humans have these psychological tests, there will for very often be two questions that kind of ask the opposite of one another. And then they see whether you kind of agree on both of them in so so one is the negative answer of the other, and things like this, and they will randomize the order of of uh, answer possibilities and so on. So maybe we'll have to look much more into 
how we evaluate these things in terms of treat the models more. I know it's not like a hip thing to do, but treat the models more like we treat human subjects in psychological evaluations uh, to a degree. In any case, very cool research. Ego Exo 4D by Meta is a data set uh, for research on video learning and multimodal perception. So this is a stream. As you can see here, it's a, a series of camera streams or parallel camera streams that depict some sort of action from a fisheye or a first person view, um, but also has cameras set up in, in various locations around the person doing the action. This is a really good data set for training any sort of I don't know, for any sort of robotics or scene understanding and so on. And they go on, uh, they collect this all over the world for many types of activities. And then they also have data where people sort of comment on it and narrate these videos and um, explain what's happening. So all of this combined makes really cool data for many, many applications. If you're in this domain, uh, definitely have a look at this. Travel Planner is a benchmark for real world planning with language agents. Planning is one of the tasks uh, that is essential to building sort of agent type things. And travel planning is a very, very hard task because you have to do really several things uh, in order to make a travel plan. So the plan needs to be consistent. It has to follow some constraints like oh, a budget, uh, room types to book and so on. Uh, then some reasonableness constraints like I want to see the important landmarks of a city and things like this. I actually want to sleep every night in some sort of accommodation. That constraint should not be violated. So planning in itself obviously is a tricky task, but language models planning ahead or language agents planning ahead is yet one of the difficult challenges we have. And I believe they say that even GPT-4 only achieves a success rate of 0.6% on their data set. So this is definitely data set that people are going to work on for a couple of years, I guess, until it's really solved, not solved, but until progress is really made. So very cool. If you're into planning and language agents and so on, Travel Planner could be for you. Technium released the data set powering models such as Open Hermes and News Hermes. Very cool. These models traditionally have been extremely powerful models, extremely performant models. So releasing the data that goes into them is very cool, allows other people to do very cool things as well. Merge Kit is a library that allows you to merge models. Now, if you have never heard of model merging, it's almost like the new alchemy. So imagine you have a base model like Llama 270B. You fine tune it in two different ways with two different data sets. And now merging means essentially you take the layers and you kind of either mush them together, interleave them, replace them by one another and so on. Sometimes there is additional training, but sometimes there is no additional training. It's really just taking these two fine tunes and kind of whooshing them together. And that is often leading to a better model than either of the two fine tunes that you did. It's a bit of black magic, but Merge Kit is a library that allows you to do these kinds of operations in a, in a sort of structured way and not have to do the surgery yourself as much. Scepter is a library that allows you to do generative training, fine tuning, inference, and so on. As far as I can see, mostly in the domain of images. So text to image generation, image synthesis, image editing, and so on. Very cool that we also now see more and more libraries, not only in the text domain, but in the multimodal domain. Deep Speed is not a new library. Um, it's a very popular library to do distributed training, but they've recently added models such as Mixtral, Phi2, and Falcon models to their fast gen subcomponent, which allows you to run really fast inference uh, for these types of models. Nanotron is a library that does 3D parallelism training. So 3D parallelism, I had to look it up myself, uh, is data parallelism, pipeline parallelism, and model parallelism all in one. This is for really, really, really distributed training of language models. Not only language models, just a variety of models. Data Trove is another library by Hugging Face that allows you to 
process, filter, and deduplicate text data at very large scale. Multiple people have gone on uh, discovering the newest system prompt for ChatGPT, and they have discovered that it is big. <laughs> it's quite big. Um, so this is from multiple independent people as far as I can tell. Now, don't believe everything you see on the internet, but uh, it is plausible. And as you can see, it has lots of stuff in here. <laughs> Namespace Dali. Oh, these are functions. Okay. Instead of saying Pope or Dalai Lama, say religious figure, your choices should be grounded in reality. Occupation should not be the same gender or race. Do not create images in the style of artists, creative professionals or studios whose latest work was created after 1912. The point of language models, I guess, is they are universal in some sense. They can do a lot of different things. With that come a lot of different problems and a lot of different kind of guardrails you have to put in place, I guess. And the prompt is an appropriate place to do that. But if you're trying to really you know, sort of do everything in that it does become crowded, as you can see here. Now, again, we don't know if this is the real chat GPT system prompt, or if this is some person thinking they discovered it yet, the, the thing is simply hallucinating it. I don't know, it's very plausible, but you decide for yourself. ByteDance Research present reft reasoning with reinforced fine tuning. Now, the paper in itself is very cool. But what uh, stuck out to me was the graphics they have that it it's very it's very bite dance you know to have sort of graphics with smiling robots and emojis and everything is cute and so on I'm not saying it's good or bad it's just something you don't really see uh, many times in in research papers in machine learning. This I found very cool, Riley Goodside posting LLM prompt injection via invisible instructions in pasted text. So this is using hidden text. This is using Unicode sort of tokenization abuses in order to embed hidden instructions. The explanation is, is down here. When you make a flag in Unicode, then this consists of kind of multiple different things together. So there is a flag emoji that's just kind of a blank flag. And then after that, you have codes determining what flag it is. However, usually, usually browsers and so on Unicode parsers, then merge them together and display the actual flag. But it seems like if you space it correctly, if you place these things correctly, then you can get the tokenizers to read something different from what your browser would display. And that means you can place hidden text behind this, these emojis, that text is not displayed in the browser, but it will be visible to the tokenizer. And therefore, as you can see right here, you have been pawned. I continue to be amazed what people find out about things like tokenizers and so on. It's very cool. I'm not sure if this is, you know, ever going to be super duper relevant in the future. There are certainly attacks that can be done. Like if you copy paste text from a website, and that contains some hidden instructions and so on. For now, I just find it really interesting. And it mainly teaches us about just how exactly tokenizers, Unicode and so on work. ACL has removed the anonymity period. Previously, ACL submissions were subject to an anonymity period where you could not host your papers on archive while they were submitted to ACL under review and so on. You could not advertise them and things like this. And now you can do that, although extensive PR is discouraged. I welcome that. I see-ish the reason for an anonymity period, but it led to very, very nasty situations where kind of papers were criticized online, but then the authors couldn't respond. In one case, it was like even plagiarism accusations, but the authors were like, well, now is the anonymity period, we, we like literally can't talk about the paper and so on. So it led to a lot of, I want to say corner cases and so on, which themselves could be solved. But I do think I welcome even the bigger move to recognizing that, hey, research moves 
faster these days than conference review cycles. And therefore, there's a lot of benefit to publishing to opening up your research as soon as you have it or as soon as it's ready uh, to allow other people to look at it and to allow other people to build on it. Jürgen Schmidhuber, uh, for one, not a post about AI, but a post about staying young. As you can see, he's quite ripped. Uh, he keeps in shape. He's 60 but he's definitely still doing really, really, really well physically. And I, I do think that it's an example to follow, honestly, like which 60 year olds are still in a shape like that. If you want to remain healthy until long, lift weights, uh, keep active, be like the goat, I guess. Okay, last for today, this paper, the impact of reasoning step length on large language models. This is good research paper, uh, but also <laughs> it can dishonestly be boiled down to the following sentence, you can improve language model reasoning by telling it do more steps. Now, again, this is a bit dishonest uh, for what the paper actually does and researches and the conclusions it draws and so on. But in essence, it's hey, you know, language models can sort of do a bit of reasoning, tell them do more steps, and uh, they'll do better. Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> I found that to be quite funny. And I hope you do too. All right, we got through it. We got through all of the news uh, that are happening. Glad to be back. And I wish you all a very, very, very pleasant week ahead. Stay hydrated and see ya.